I'm Bill O'Mara from Analog Devices, um, and this session is on principles and technology targets for chip level photonic integration. And I think it goes back to uh, some of sl the slides that Kim presented at the start when he talked about key roadmap points. Silicon has uh, a huge manufacturing infrastructure, and so the silicon learning curve really carries uh, huge leverage uh, for photonic integration. So our first speaker today, well, at this session, uh, is Mark Beals. And he's going to talk about monolithic silicon photonics front end implementation. Uh, Mark is the Associate Director of Research for the MIT Materials Processing and Microphotonics Center, where he's principally responsible for program management and sponsored research programs. His research interests focus on light wave interaction with matter for communications, sensors, and energy applications. He is active in the research and development of integrated electronic photonic devices and circuits using silicon-based CMOS processing. In the DARPA EPIC program with BAE, MIT, and Bell Labs, he was responsible for developing the monolithically integrated process flow for electronic photonic RF channelizer device using a 150 nanometer CMOS process technology. So Mark. Good morning. It's a privilege to be here amongst the highly esteemed colleagues and uh, industry representatives. I also see a lot of the inventors of the research uh, materials and devices that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, to preface this talk, it was ta uh, identified as being kind of a primer. Uh, a tutorial associated with dealing with monolithic integration in CMOS. We talk about it very flippantly, and uh, yet we don't see it as pervasive as we think it should be. Um, we see evidence of the use of the silicon photonics platform in photonic type circuits and devices, but fundamentally we're worried about or interested in looking at electronic photonic integration and how do we leverage that and how do we maximize the utility of photonic device designs. So uh, we're going to cover just a little bit about the Silicon CMOS platform. Some of you may be familiar with it. Hopefully the rest of you, uh, it will be of interest. And then we'll talk about uh, kind of the key photonic materials that are necessary to look at utilizing the CMOS platform. Uh, then uh, the other really big enabler is the active photonic components. A lot of what we see about silicon photonics is dealing with the waveguides which I consider passive. These are uh, devices that may have thermo-optic uh, thermo heaters that drive them, control them, but the active elements of the OEEO conversion is actually the most critical and, and most challenging. Lastly, we'll just touch on what we see as the future of this potential technology. So in the context of uh, 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 light wave interaction moving in from uh, the edge, from the fiber to the chip, uh, early on the research group looked at immediately the closest, shortest reach, which is intra-chip communications, and realizing that eventually we're going to have to deal with that. And you can see from this chart that uh, I think this group has seen many times from Kim, uh, as we see that light wave moving closer from uh, the edge of the network to the edge of the device, now talking about on the chip. So this is an old picture, but it helps give you a perspective of what we're talking about when we consider integration in CMOS. Um, pretty much it's, uh, you're leveraging a very planarized process of precision uh, materials uh, laid down from a very active region at the silicon substrate at the bottom, but the bulk of the rest of the processing is associated with the interconnect. And so as we've realized great uh, increase in functionalization and density of devices, it's done with ever increasing and complex interconnect. Um, we've seen uh, advantages or uh, improvement in the technology over time with global planarization using CMP. We've seen the device shrink by use of lithography. Uh, but all in all, uh, we have a material system that is very actually friendly to photonic integration, particularly if we look at telecom wavelengths of 1.5 micron, we're uniquely set up to leverage both uh, silicon as a transparent uh, optical waveguide as well as silicon nitride if we consider integrated photonic circuits. But also we have a very powerful set of processing tools that allows us to actually deal with the issues of very precise geometry controls required for optic devices. I hit the magic button that I think uh, Bill hit. So um, 
a lot of research has already gone on on photonic devices that are high index contrast design. And by high index contrast, we're talking about mode confinement that gets us down into the 200, 300, 400 nanometer range. Um, when we look at uh, these types of devices, we're worried about uh, transmission loss and um, size. We're worried about the ability to bend or, or curve these uh, waveguides. And so in the case of silicon nitride, our index contrast is only about 0.5, and that affects our bend radius significantly. But it also means that if we look at a planarized structure, we're going to be dealing with something that's no thinner than about 400 nanometers. And this is an important consideration when you look at the planarized structure of CMOS, particularly at the front end. Silicon, because of its higher index, we get a better index contrast of 2.0. And we now look at uh, in a TE mode type uh, waveguide that's only 200 nanometers thick. As a result of that 200 nanometers, we now can realize using that waveguide at the front end of a silicon CMOS device. Um, the other benefit is that at, two point, at, the, at silicon crystal, we end up with excellent uh, low optical losses as a result of um, uh, good fabrication practices. And we've realized some great results already produced. The pictures down below show a fourth order filter that's built in, a, in our DARPA EPIC program, which I'm going to use as our bench case for integration. Uh, showing excellent uh, tunability and control. On the active side, a number of devices have also been created on the same scale, um, originally based on silicon uh, as a complement to the CMOS process. And these are the well-known uh, silicon ring resonators really pr uh, uh, invented and, and promoted by Mikhail Lipson. Um, again, very small devices, 15 micron radius. Um, they're uh, doped so that you end up with carrier injection that allows you to control the uh, performance of the ring is either absorption or uh, passing of signal. And they can be fairly fast, um, but they do have a very narrow spectral range. The more challenging yet optimist, optimistic is the germanium devices. Germanium was the original transistor material way back in the days when the transistors were created, but it suffered a problem that it's uh, water soluble in processing. Germanium oxide is not a stable oxide. Um, but in the context of CMOS processing, we can actually protect the germanium films we produce and utilize its, uh, its band gap at 0.7 volts to actually be matched at the telecom wavelength of 1.5 micron. Uh, that germanium type device can actually be leveraged as a platform device, like a transistor, to not only build photodetectors, but modulators, and as you've heard more recently, uh, the germanium-based laser. So as a result of the scale of germanium, though, we actually can see a structure that can also compete and fit within the process flow of silicon CMOS. I did it again. I see Bill's problem here. This is this power button. All right, so we've already talked about index contrast. Just to reinforce, the, the loss associated with using silicon can be minimized by actually causing a, a, a smaller square-based waveguide, allowing the evanescent mode to exist more in the cladding. But the problem with that is we have coupling losses uh, and we also lose the size benefit of confinement. So our preference is actually a TE mode, highly confined device that allows us to work with single mode. And so the design of this structure is a 200 nanometer by 500 nanometer cross section uh, designed right at the single mode cutoff. As a result, its evanescent mode is uh, minimal and uh, we can actually tolerate fairly tight bend turns. So we built these, and uh, just as we expected, the silicon crystal is excellent because it's highly temperature tolerant. It does not have any bulk absorption issues, and it does produce the lowest optical loss, um, less than 0.35 dB per centimeter. The other material that we want to introduce is PECVD silicon, or amorphous silicon. Uh, initially kind of uh, not intuitive, but the PECVD allows us to build vertically uh, coupled or level-to-level -level structures manipulating light beyond the silicon plane, or if we use the SOI substrate. The, low, the higher loss is offset by the fact that we only use them in very short segments, less than 35 microns in length. We can tolerate the 3.5 dB per centimeter loss and not impact the overall signal going through our device and circuits. We do have to be careful about temperature processing where uh, the conversion of amorphous silicon to polysilicon does lead to even higher loss, about 10 dB per centimeter. So the process flow I'm going to talk about is built out of the DARPA EPIC program that we were participating in back in 2005. Uh, this was a collaboration uh, with Bell Labs, uh, and BAE Systems, and also our collaborators at Cornell, and uh, we also had um, advanced wave research. 
So the objective was to combine the el uh, electronic photonic elements into a CMOS integrated circuit. But the difference here is we were not constrained to living with the CMOS process flow as it was. We were allowed to actually build from the ground up, making this program more unique than the others. So we were actually able to leverage the CMOS flow, modify it specifically, protecting the CMOS flow elements that were important for electric, electronic circuits, but we were able to create photonic circuits. So the components associated with this channelizer are actually uh, very exciting in the sense that they combine um, uh, uh, signal encoding, we have signal routing. Um, on the photonic devices, we have a mode transformers, we've got modulators, waveguide splitters. And on the electronic side, we have, fundamentally, we have a modulator driver, which will be encoding the, the incoming signal, and a phase shifter for our uh, uh, tuning and uh, uh, segregation of the signal, and then a uh, TIA, transimpedance amplifier, for the photo detector. So the idea is that we have a very broadband signal coming in, an RF signal. We're able to encode it into the optical domain. We're able to process that signal, separating out the information into multiple channels, parallel processing, and that information is then rapidly uh, uh, analyzed electronically. So to do this, we use the BA uh, system CMOS process. It uh, was a 150 nanometer technology node. Um, it was used for ASICs, there were field program gate arrays, uh, microprocess, and so forth. But the key thing here was it was a, a SOI-based substrate that we were working with. Um, it did have salicylated contacts, which was an important element for us to get access to. And um, overall, it was a CMP planarization process. Oh, one other part. From the research side, this was actually exciting because we actually had two different gate thicknesses that allowed us to look at a variety of different devices. So fundamentally, you think silicon photonics, we're looking at devices that need to operate around one volt or less. But this technology gave us a gate oxide that allowed us to even look at explored devices needing a few more volts. So in the case of RF signal processing or mixed signals, these higher voltages are needed to really work at perhaps some of the higher 80 gigahertz or more type of uh, unique applications that might occur. So in considering the integration, uh, for us, it was fairly obvious where to go, but um, you have choices. You have the front end of the line, which is where the device is built. It's also where the temperatures are higher, allowing you to consider uh, uh, crystalline materials. You do have what we call the back end of the line, which is the interconnect, the wiring, or the global interconnect. Their uh, spaces, interlevel spaces, are greater, allowing you to deal with larger structures. But because we wanted to insert our active devices, we wanted to leverage the silicon crystal surface and basically put our devices on the coplanar with the electronic transistors. So we did consider a lot of factors uh, impacting field effect transistors, uh, cross-contamination, uh, everything you need to do already in a CMOS process. I did it again. So two types of flows were developed. Uh, one was based on bulk silicon. And so we did create one which basically requires uh, a shallow trench isolation everywhere around every optical element you want. So a fairly deep silicon, wide swath, one and a half micron channels needed to be uh, evolved around all of the active elements. To interact with that device, you would use a top coupled waveguide that would come in and we could couple in through uh, a buck coupled structure into whatever active element. Not as desirable as we'd like. SOI, though, made things much easier. So using a silicon oxide uh, uh, SOI uh, substrate, the silicon is actually predefined, giving us a lower cladding structure, but it also is complementary to advanced electronics, supporting very high speed type uh, signaling, uh, doping control uh, associated with the uh, NPN structures. So in, we chose to go with the SOI process flow. So to begin uh, integrating in the process, we're trying to leverage as much of the CMOS process as we can without affecting it. Um, so to begin with, shallow trench isolation is used actually to define our waveguides. It's the same process being used to isolate the transistors. So before we do that, there's pad oxide, nitride, you're forming the gate, func uh, great, uh, gate areas, electronics, but then you form the channels. The second part is for waveguides, smoothing is important because scattering is an issue. And uh, we use uh, existing uh, processes for uh, oxidation, re uh, reduction of the sidewall in three steps that gives us a dramatically improved uh, waveguide performance. And then we cap that lower layer with an oxide and planarize it. So that gives us the primary routing waveguide structure. It also gives us the implant, uh, the NWL, PWL structures of the CMOS device. 
So the next step is this second, leveled, uh, second level coupled waveguide. So this is a new element we're putting in the flow. This is an amorphous silicon layer. It's only 200 nanometers thick, deposited as a co-level uh, co of polysilicon on oxide, all within the thickness before first level contact. So we're not even over 600 nanometers thick. So we're, we're actually doing good. We cap that with an oxide. Uh, and planarize that. So now we have kind of a setup for our structure. We've already, uh, we've actually etched those waveguides into the features that we're going to use to couple. So now on the active materials, we like germanium because of its absorption edge uh, at the 1.5 micron uh, uh, wavelength. And you can see that it's a very steep, sharp line. As a result of that sharp absorption edge, we actually can apply uh, voltage field effects that can turn this device into not only just a photodetector, but a modulator. The Franz Keller's effect that was developed by Jafeng Lu and Jurgen um, was definitely realized as a powerful modulator concept where small voltages could be, uh, through a modulator driver, could create a modulator device allowing transmission or signal encoding of an incoming uh, light source. The, uh, there's competing de germanium detector designs, but most of those are fairly thick, and they require templated uh, uh, lattice matching to try to minimize uh, 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 defects in the germanium crystal. So mismatch of silicon to germanium growth epi is a concern. And so there was a number of devices that could have been considered. Um, fortunately, we were able to prove uh, through Jürgen Mitchell and the team's work that germanium could be actually deposited directly on silicon. And we do that in a two-step process where you actually put a seed layer down of germanium at lower temperature. That seed layer becomes the basis that you then can grow a monocrystalline germanium film of low enough defect to operate as an optoelectronic medium, basically less than 10 of the seventh defects per centimeter squared. The other interesting uh, aspect of the germanium is that we know that through thermal cycling in small defined structures, we can glide defects out. And so the picture on the right shows the effect of cyclic anneal on germanium as deposited. One other feature about the germanium process is that because of the elevated temperature, we have a strain-induced effect on the crystal that actually shifts our band gap in alignment with the uh, wavelength of interest. We can also use dope and to sh further shift the actual band gap alignment to whatever wavelength we're interested in. So these are a couple pictures of how we can process germanium, showing a very good smooth surface germanium growth. But there's two uh, considerations. One could be a subtractive etched germanium structure, or the other is the uh, where I learned from uh, my work with IBM, the damascene approach, where you actually open up oxide trenches and then deposits germanium selectively within these structures and then planarize. Uh, it turns out that the selective approach is actually superior for providing better control of the germanium structures uh, stability of the germanium, and coupling into waveguides. So just uh, one of the aspects about the germanium devices to give the benefit of waveguide coupling, uh, the original germanium on silicon work was for free space detectors, and the picture on the left shows that, you know, the, the performance of the detector is based on both the uh, uh, absorption length in alignment with the free carrier path associated with the PIN diode structure. So the absorption uh, performance is limited based on that path. In the lateral coupling of light into germanium, we can change that and such that we can ha independently tune the absorption length from the carrier path length. As a result, we can re realize very efficient, very low power, low capacitance photo detectors. The other aspect of this, the PIN device structure sets up a natural bias that the, the photo detector actually works without a biased element on it naturally. So uh, I'm going to skip past this to move into some other things, but the free space germanium diode, you're showing uh, the ideal responsivity material uh, where we're limited due to that uh, narrow uh, absorption length. Whereas in the coupled structure, um, uh, we can actually get, uh, I think it's next, the, free, uh, the um, performance of a, a waveguide coupled germanium detector is on the order of one amp per watt or better. So, if we're using um, uh, germanium photodetectors, we have a couple of choices. We've looked at bottom coupled structures, the idea that we would just uh, simply use the silicon crystal of the SOI uh, and couple into the bottom. We've built these and we have uh, uh, realized them, but their performance suffers due to uh, scattering associated with that initial growth interface, uh, the germanium seed layer. And this is some of the results of that work. Um, 
Moving forward, butt coupled devices is really an enabler here. Um, these structures make use of that SOI primary optical bus, evanescently coupled into a tapered waveguide made of the PCV silicon into the edge of the germanium. So we're able to precisely launch the light into the germanium. And this is essentially important because it lets us make the most efficient photo detectors and it also allows us to create the modulator. And down below you see the sequence of flow picking up from where we've created the waveguide structure where we would then open up the oxide, select the glow germanium, planarize it, creating our coupled waveguide coupled structure, and then we would continue with contacts and metallization. I have more detail in a few seconds. The silicon waveguide vertical couplers are unique in that they're actually very process tolerant. Because they're tapered, the actual coupling point can shift because we are looking at a taper. Um, so as either photolithography, precision, overlay, and or etch variations can cause coupling problems in general, the taper gives us that tolerance of moving that coupling point. So moving forward, the bottom coupled germanium detector cross-section is here. So we've already defined the, uh, uh, the lower, we have a vertical PIN structure. So the silicon on the bottom is going to be P-type, doped with boron, and we create a salicylated contact in preparation for uh, electrical interconnect later. We then open up the oxide and cut through the silicon waveguide and defining that open trench uh, where we're going to grow our germanium in, which is the far right picture. Um, germane, the trench is cleaned. We then would grow the germanium and then would planarize that germanium into that structure. So the selective germanium actually has to be overfilled substantially and then we protect it with a silicon cap layer and then planarize it to stopping to a silicon nitride layer. All of these are built within 600 nanometers. So we haven't even exceeded the first contact level of CMOS. Once that's done, uh, once the germanium is planarized, we need to put the upper electrode in place. And we do that by a thin polysilicon electrode, uh, 1,000 angstroms thick. We then, in this case, we doped it with arsenic implant um, and then uh, proceeded to actually move into the contact level. So once we did that, we built up the oxide with HDP to first, this is one micron in this technology node. Uh, contacts were opened, filled with tungsten, and then our first level metal interconnect. Um, and then it proceeded from there. Uh, the initial results were actually pretty exciting, um, showing this flat responsivity uh, over a wide range, this 1470, 1570, and this is for an 80 micron long device that's only 500 nanometers wide, 200 nanometers, uh, 400 nanometers thick. Excellent responsivity at one amp per watt, and the other part here is the um, uh, uh, 12, 12 picosecond responsivity, so very good, very low dark current. Um, I'm going to move through the, the overview, but basically butt couple turned out to be an excellent, excellent design and uh, incorporated into our technology. Uh, uh, the silicon microring modulator is another approach we talked about earlier. Um, here we show Macaulay Lipson's work showing the uh, shift in um, uh, absorption based on effective voltage and creating the modulation effect. I'm going to move forward. The same device that we made the germanium in the front end is also what we use for the modulator. And so in this uh, diagram, we basically use a shortened germanium structure, but instead of actually extracting the carriers, we're applying a field. And that field through a modulator driver allows us to create the absorption or passing of signals uh, based on that uh, effect. So the, the Franz Kelgis effect works effectively by working at this lower absorption region to make it more efficient. And so voltages on the order of one and a half volts create enough field effect to cause uh, the shift in absorption enough to make it a modulator. Um, this diagram just shows kind of the performance of uh, the modulator relative to field. Um, we see that the, the larger the field, we get this deepening of the Franz Kelgis oscillations, which is desirable uh, for the modulation effect. Uh, we see the operating wavelength. Um, we have uh, um, uh, interference due to our optical coupling to our chip, but overall we see excellent uh, performance on the uh, modulator. So finishing up, uh, one other element that you can provide is, is temperature control. Uh, issues of photonics, and precision, especially if you're dealing with resonators, um, the process flow we can incorporate actually a salicylated contact that we can then drive as a thermo-optic phase shifter. Um, in this case, it's an optional element. Uh, it's positioned actually above first level contact beyond a micron to avoid uh, absorption losses with the metal. 
So um, the program actually resulted in producing excellent passive waveguide devices, filters. These are fourth order pole, uh, zero pole filters operating as a, a mock Zender devices designed by our friends at Bell Labs. Um, they showed excellent tunability and control using that thermal optic effect. I think I'm in. So relative to this program, we actually realized a few new steps into a CMOS process flow. We didn't talk about the CMOS device elements. Um, one of the interesting aspects of the work was it led to actually the realization that really a bi CMOS type technology is needed. Uh, if we look at high speed device operation as opposed to just digital uh, communications. Um, uh, and the new materials represent a, a plasma enhanced CVD silicon waveguide for bu uh, coupling into the end of our germanium epi, which is also another new element. But everything else about the CMOS process was left intact, and we leveraged quite a few of the processes, including ion implantation for lightly doped drains for our bottom P contact, as well as uh, wet chemical treatments of uh, cleaning surfaces for um, our waveguides and uh, germanium structures. So challenges going forward, obviously there are quite a few. If you're looking at manufacturing, we're looking at reliability and yield issues, cost, economics, but from a viability of the technology, it looks very good. Moving forward, um, due to the competition of real estate at the silicon surface, the demand for moving it into either another chip, you know, multi-chip integration is, is currently the thought, but what if we could move into the interconnect? The role of the optical uh, networks, if you will, the optical conversion is really to replace that interconnect and enable high bandwidth, uh, high speed operation. So one of the concepts that we came up early on was what if we could create an optical device structure that works within the interconnect? So we preserve this monolithic integration idea, but can we actually do that? And the challenge is germanium, can germanium be grown at a lower temperature? And it turns out that it can. Uh, I believe Kevin McComber was the PhD student whose thesis proved that uh, you could actually grow single crystalline germanium off amorphous silicon seed at low temperature. And so in these confined structures, you actually find that the germanium is so constrained that it doesn't allow defects. And so we're actually able to grow germanium out of these low temperature uh, seed layers, and uh, we can then subsequently process them for active optical elements. The benefit of being in the back end, though, is we now actually have the flexibility to introduce nitride, which nitride also exists in this realm. We're dealing with uh, thicker spacings. If we're up at the global wiring level where uh, current power is higher, usually at these levels, we also see more space allowed with the interconnect as compared to, say, the front end uh, first level power. So this is an exciting development. And then moving forward, the other exciting development is the fact that the germanium has been uh, engineered into a laser. And so uh, it was mentioned yesterday, in 2010, uh, Kimberling, Jurgen Mitchell, and group produced the first uh, electrically pumped germanium laser. So um, I think I don't have time to get into this, do I? Um, engineering, it basically means that we take advantage of our strain engineering due to the high temperature processing. We dope it, uh, the material, such that we minimize the L Valley transition creating a more, kind of creating the gamma valley transition so that we can actually have um, photon uh, emission. So the results is that we have a germanium laser that has sufficient power to not only support on-chip optical communication, but chip to chip. At eight milliwatts, it's very sufficient to support even wavelength division multiplexing. So this is a, a phenomenal result that we had hoped to achieve and it was done. Uh, it does require fairly high doping uh, at the uh, uh, half, 10 to the 19th level, but still, it's an exciting uh, result. There's even more. So in the concept of integration, um, where up to this point, electronic photonic integration was strictly the passive and active devices for detection, modulation, filtering, uh, we now can take that laser and we can basically embed it within the monolithic flow, and we hope to be able to realize that. Uh, lastly, the uh, future of multi-core is the other main driver, you know, high-performance computing. And from our work with CSAIL and specifically uh, Professor Anand Agarwal, we, he basically conveyed that scaling to 22 nanometers would actually enable physically the creation of a 4,000-core multi-core processor. We just don't know how to work with it. We can't power it. We can't connect it. So um, I'm going to skip this part and just go to the, the issues of interconnect processing. It's getting very complex. 
But what if we could leverage the optical network, the actual communications of uh, transmission across the whole chip using that optical interconnect? And the idea that you can send information to any tile, and a tile can be multiple cores, process that information and easily send it across the whole chip. So that's the basis of what we call all-tall computing. I think Professor Watts has talked about this before. Uh, but the idea is that you have a power, a, a WDM optical waveguide that you tap a selective wavelength, modulate that, and that modulated signal is uh, the information from that processor sent broadcast to other uh, tiles across the chip for processing. Um, and so we can actually transmit words through a series of parallel uh, optical lines. Um, and the vision of it is that we can actually look at the optical network uh, uh, with network nodes in, say, 16 uh, uh, mesh tile, electrically meshed interconnected uh, uh, core processors. And so just from the standpoint of physical size, we took our silicon photonics and looked at how they would just physically allow it as a concept, not necessarily finessed. But if we incorporated the silicon screen and modulator, the detector, our filters, and these are second order filters, and then a filter with integrated detector, um, what would that look like? And so if we scale this to a one millimeter square tile, and that was the idea that, that uh, microprocessor or DSPs can actually be scaled to one millimeter tile at 22 nanometer, how much space do we need? Well, this says that uh, a 40 channel optical bus could be encoded and fit within half that tile. Now, we've got a long way to go before getting there, but it's uh, pretty exciting to look at the capability here of uh, a 64 Lambda uh, WDM network on chip that can talk chip to chip as well. So I think uh, that's what I have today. There's so much more about this in terms of devices and so forth, but uh, I thank you for your attention. Still making up for time. Uh, <clears throat> time for maybe one quick question. Thanks so much. You talked a lot about the photo detectors uh, that you were building. Did you, have, do you ever notice a preference on the wafer for orientation north, south, to east, west, or does that not matter for you? Orientation of, of the diode. So, you know, if it's longer than broad. Does the orientation on the wafer matter? I don't think, uh, no. Uh, and, and partly because our, our, we're not worried about the, the, the crystal orientation is coming off kind of an amorphous kind of seeded layer. So I don't think you're actually seeing anything like we talk about off cut or things that we deal with like three five material. In general, it's just the absorption. Oh, sorry. So, no, I guess the answer is just fundamentally no. Um, there's not been any orientation specific to the germanium crystal aligned relative to. Um, uh, to the substrate. And, and partly, the other thing I wanted to warn you about is, is we're guilty of quickly moving from telecom applications, datacom, datacom as far as digital signal processing versus RF high performance signal processing. And each one of those kind of has a different optimization a little bit. But what's exciting is these same devices, material structures are applicable to all of them. It's into the circuit design, the PDK, the design kits that are going to be created that allow us to actually blow this out into massive VLSI scale. And investment. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank very you. Much, Mark.